and welcome to the second installment of our SMS Dialogue series. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Marvin Hanisch and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. I'm also the SMS engagement officer for the Cooperative Strategies Interest Group, which is hosting today's webinar. With me here is our first speaker, Tony Tong, who is Professor of Strategy and Entrepreneurship at the Lead School of Business at the University of Colorado Boulder. He has published widely on strategy, uh, widely and not wildly, uh, on strategy, innovation, and globalization, and is particularly interested in platform governance, about which he will also speak today. Our second speaker is Feng Su, Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. He is a recognized thought leader on platform strategy, digital transformation, and innovation. His talk will be on platform competition. After each talk, we will have a short discussion led by Christina Kipriano, who is an assessment professor at the e, uh, at IE Business School and herself deeply involved in platform research. I'm delighted uh, that we have such a distinguished group of scholars here today, and I look forward to a wonderful dialogue. And without further ado, Tony, please uh, take the stage. Let's see if it works. How's it going? It's good? Okay. Thank you, Marvin, for the uh, wonderful uh, introduction and uh, uh, for hosting today's webinar. Um, so my topic today is uh, platform governance. Or more specifically, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the organizational governance of digital platforms. So uh, governance is a uh, sort of a big topic and uh, uh, frankly, uh, governance is also a sort of a fuzzy topic uh, because we can define governance in different ways at different levels. And things can get a little bit more tricky uh, in the platform context uh, because of the multilateral uh, relationships involved. Uh, and sometimes just the sheer number of players and transactions or interactions happening uh, on the platform. So to set the stage and also to share my own view of platform governance, uh, let me uh, I'll start with a few definitions that I found uh, from the literature. So the term platform governance first appears actually uh, in an MIS scholar uh, by uh, Tijuana et al. Uh, in uh, uh, IS journal called ISR uh, in 2010. And they have a simple definition uh, of platform governance, uh, which is just uh, who makes what decision uh, about a platform. And this is consisting of three things, uh, decision right partitioning, uh, control, and ownership. So that's the first definition I found. And then uh, this uh, idea of platform governance uh, began to uh, pick up more interest in recent years uh, in management uh, field. So in a recent paper uh, in uh, journal management, uh, it's a review paper by uh, Eust and uh, uh, Melissa, uh, they actually uh, create a term called platform governance and ecosystem orchestration, uh, which uh, they consider to be one of the four streams of platform research. Uh, so to them, uh, platform governance and ecosystem orchestration means uh, powerful players influence or orchestrate the behavior and the outcomes of other members of the, uh, plaf uh, of the ecosystem uh, and the behaviors and the outcomes of the ecosystem overall. So that's their definition uh, published in 2021. Uh, and in the most recent paper by uh, Kreshmer and colleagues uh, published in SMJ's special issue, uh, they also talk about platform governance and coordination structure uh, in which they specifically are referring uh, to the allocation of decision rights or control rights uh, between the platform provider in the various complementors and participants, and also the rules that are imposed uh, by the platform. Uh, so uh, in a most recent uh, paper by uh, myself and my co-authors uh, published in Journal Management's uh, special uh, issue uh, in, for, for annual review, uh, we sort of synthesized the existing research and we create a definition uh, which goes as follows. So platform governance, refers to the rules, policies, inducements, and constraints uh, that platform owners develop and utilize to address market frictions uh, in uh, coordinating and the deploying uh, co-specialized assets and capabilities. Uh, 
So compared with other authors, uh, we believe that our definition uh, to some extent is broader as we do not specifically focus on specific uh, aspects, you know, like decision right allocation or particular platform rules or policies. Uh, but we also might be seen as being narrower uh, because we focus on the central role that the platform owner uh, plays. And we give more attention to using theories uh, of organizational economics to understand the relationship between uh, the platform owner and the complement force. And we did not give much attention to the other members of the platform or ecosystem uh, as well as their relationships. So uh, in this slide, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the organizational uh, perspective on platform and also try to uh, uh, see if we can have a organizational economics perspective of platform governance. So uh, we know that platform research first began in economics where platforms are often viewed as a marketplace, right? But recent research management and also other fields in business school are studying how digital platforms can orchestrate or organize uh, complementary activity to create value and to generate profits. Uh, and this suggests that platforms can be seen as a distinct organizational form. Uh, so this organizational perspective of platforms uh, began to, to emerge uh, in recent years. Uh, I think one of the earliest paper uh, on uh, platforms as a unique organization or matter organization uh, was uh, by Gulati, Pranam, and Tushman uh, in 2012 uh, in SMJ, uh, in which they offer one of the pioneering efforts in conceptualizing platforms as a type of uh, matter organization uh, where uh, autonomous actors, like firms, individuals, they put themselves under the informal authority of the platform firm. Uh, now, a uh, recent paper by uh, Krashma et al., uh, they uh, followed in the same spirit. Uh, they are uh, the uh, latest recognition of this important shift uh, from uh, important shift in management scholars, uh, conceptualization of platforms from markets to uh, organizations or to matter organization, uh, from pricing to governance. Uh, as they seek to uh, create a link between uh, platforms and uh, hybrids. Uh, in our most recent uh, uh, journal management uh, review uh, article, uh, we, uh, we follow the, uh, the footsteps uh, of this prior scholars. Uh, we maintain that digital platforms can be seen as uh, hybrid organizations. Uh, now there are, you can think about this multiple similarities between digital platforms and uh, uh, our established understanding of, of hybrids. Uh, you know, one of them I believe is that, uh, you know, uh, just like traditional interfering relationships, uh, which, in which the linkages are, uh, you know, not just rooted in contracts, but also rooted in some type of organizational synergies or complementarities or technological complement complementarities. Uh, in digital platforms, uh, you know, the uh, complementarity between, uh, co-specialized parties, you know, platform owners and complementors. And you can call that complementarity, you know, as interdependence, or, you know, modular, or moderate amount of modularity, you know, et cetera. Uh, that complementarity also underpin uh, the uh, emergence uh, of the, uh, I think the co cooperative organization, uh, which I think is, is something that's really interesting to uh, scholars in the uh, cooperative strategy interest group, right? Uh, and the second thing which I, I find interesting is that uh, hybrids, they uh, rely on partners you know, pour resources together, right? Uh, they have some sort of division of labor, you know, th a lot of times through uh, uh, the allocation of decision rights and other times, you know, through the use of, you know, uh, authority or, you know, uh, inter-organizational routines. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, each party uh, would uh, uh, have ownership on uh, critical assets. Uh, key assets uh, and that uh, relationship uh, can also be seen in the digital platforms uh, in the following sense. Uh, so in digital platforms, the uh, platform owner has ownership over those critical assets. You know, those are typically the core technology and you know, the platform interface or the platform infrastructure. Um, and, uh, and then they, uh, delegate or pass a lot of decision rights uh, across uh, boundaries you know, to complement us, right? And that, that motivate, incentivize complement us to uh, actually uh, you know, make uh, some sort of co-specialized co uh, assets investment uh, 
uh, to uh, work with the, the platform owner. And then in the meantime, the complementors would give up some uh, payoff rights uh, to, the, to the platform owner. So platform owners can actually uh, recoup uh, the investment uh, and uh, make a profit. Uh, so, so I believe that this linkages between uh, uh, digital platforms and hybrid organizations, they can facilitate uh, the use of uh, classic uh, theories of organizational economics uh, uh, to, uh, to, elim to, elim to illuminate how uh, platforms can uh, secure uh, cooperation from complement to us and achieve coordination at low cost. Uh, so uh, in the traditional theories of the firm, uh, you know, efficient economic organization is achieved through either uh, incentive alignment or allocation of authority or control. So we uh, use these two dimensions of uh, uh, organizational governance, incentive and control uh, to sort of synthesize prior platform governance research. Uh, so under each, so on the uh, left uh, bottom, bottom left uh, of the slide, the block uh, governance, uh, under each of the two dimensions, we also describe a, a specific set of governance uh, mechanisms related to uh, incentive and control. So for example, under incentives, we have the idea of uh, sharing resources, you know, between uh, the platform owner and the complement to us, right? Uh, such that, you know, the uh, complementors could uh, get access to use those uh, resources and become more productive uh, in, in the process. Uh, but in addition to that, you know, there's also a provision of information, uh, you know, trainings, for example, information about the customers, information about the technologies being provided. Uh, and then uh, we also have confirmed authority uh, or the delegation uh, of, um, you know, uh, decisions, uh, you know, between uh, the complementors and the uh, uh, platform owner. Uh, and then we also have uh, giving a pecuniary and non-pecuniary rewards like selective promotion or other, other means. Uh, under control, we, we talk about access control, uh, which is a, something that uh, uh, platform scholars uh, talk uh, quite a bit about. Uh, and then we have uh, output control, uh, behavior control, and external uh, relationship uh, control. So, uh, so what we do here also is that we try to uh, create a mapping between uh, platform governance and the design features uh, or design you know, uh, features that platforms can uh, leverage or can create or leverage. Uh, and then uh, we, we, as we said, we, we create a mapping between the two. Uh, so uh, for, for uh, each set of platform uh, governance mechanism, there are uh, digital and non-digital or traditional uh, design features uh, uh, could be either organizational design features or technological design features that platform owners can utilize uh, to achieve the goal of uh, platform governance. Uh, so in, in doing this, we, we are trying to, to uh, reorganize the, the vast literature on uh, platforms and especially platform uh, governance uh, into uh, a set of, uh, uh, you know, uh, articles uh, where you know, this idea, the traditional idea of uh, incentive and control uh, can try to be uh, utilized to uh, explain, uh, or try to utilize to, uh, to, to coordinate this co specialized capabilities and uh, resolving uh, uh, collective action problems in pursuit of joint value creation and the value capture uh, of each uh, party. Um, now, in the, finally, the interrelationships uh, between uh, uh, the three components here, governance, design, and value, uh, we believe that they co-evolve with the changes in external uh, environment, industry, industry, institution, uh, technological environments, and also across country and geographic borders. Uh, so that's the sort of the uh, conceptual uh, foundation uh, for, um, you know, for my own view of uh, platform governance. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, the two specific studies that uh, uh, you know uh, my co-authors and I and I did uh, to illustrate uh, uh, this idea of platform governance and how do we study in particular governance mechanisms or design features. So uh, the first one is this uh, idea of um, you know uh, the conferring uh, of authority or you know uh, delegation uh, of decision making and specific allocation of decision rights. So allocation decision rights is an important topic in traditional organizations, organizational design. And uh, when we compare uh, the allocation decision rights across 
uh, traditional organizations and platform organizations, we focus on two dimensions. Uh, the first one is uh, who has the authority to, to allocate decision rights, right? And the second piece, which I believe is equally important is who actually has the information or where's the information about, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, where's the information that, you know, uh, economic agents could be uh, could use uh, to facilitate the, uh, you know, the allocation decision rights. So in the traditional organizations, uh, we know that, uh, uh, for example, in hierarchical firms, you know, corporate headquarters have the authority to delegate decisions down a hierarchy or retain decision rights at the headquarters, right? In different relations, uh, those decision right allocation is being defined by contracts. Now in platform organization, the platform owner has the authority to delegate the decision uh, to uh, complement to us uh, on either side or both sides of the platform or retain decision rights to themselves. Uh, now, in, when it comes to information, the locus information in uh, hierarchical, hierarchical firms, uh, if local information is not available or required uh, for decision-making, uh, the decisions are centralized. Otherwise, decisions are uh, decentralized and delegated. And Interfirm relations, uh, contracts will specify what types of information and how and when are provided and transmit it between uh, partners. And uh, in platform organization, platform owner generally enjoys great information advantages uh, because uh, they have, uh, you know, the, uh, the, a lot of times the proprietary access to a lot of information that's being generated by the, uh, you know, by the consumer, by the users, and also by the complement to us, right? So, but there are also, I would believe there are also situations where the complement to us, for example, the hosts on uh, Airbnb, uh, they can possess uh, valuable information that's highly idiosyncratic and hard to uh, codify, and it's very costly to efficiently transmit it. Uh, so in those situations, uh, the decision rights, uh, are, for example, the right to set prices uh, could be uh, just delegated to the, uh, to the hosts on Airbnb. And by the way, this is a uh, working paper with uh, Ampu Mahalinga, uh, currently at the University of Utah. Uh, it's, a, it's a working paper that uh, uh, we are, we've been working on for a few years. Now, uh, to give you specific examples about the, uh, you know, the right uh, to set a price, uh, we can compare, for example, like uh, uh, right share an app like Uber and Lyft uh, with, uh, you know, this vacation rental, uh, you know, short-term uh, rental uh, market like Airbnb. Uh, for Uber and Lyft, we know that uh, the price is being set uh, by the platform or by the platform owner. Uh, because the platform owner has, uh, you know, access to uh, a lot of good information in real time and can use the big data analytics to uh, decide on the, uh, on the what's the optimal price and route. And uh, for, uh, you know, vacation rental uh, market, uh, like Airbnb or VRBO, uh, the sellers in this case, which are the uh, hosts, uh, they have uh, fine grained information about uh, uh, you know, the uh, location, you know, the specific amenities and, you know, uh, things like that. And it's uh, given that, you know, uh, advantage, information advantage, uh, Airbnb, uh, you know, actually delegates the uh, pricing right uh, to the hosts uh, rather than, you know, deciding on the price, uh, you know, itself. Uh, but they do, Airbnb, they do have algorithms uh, that provide uh, uh, assistance, uh, assistance to hosts to help them to make a decision. In other words, they give you, they, they, the Airbnb will give you a, a, a range of possible prices, you know, uh, that uh, uh, hosts can potentially charge. Uh, now, uh, I wanted to highlight this uh, uh, article just very briefly. So we, uh, in this paper, we look at the allocation of the pricing right uh, in uh, online peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending. So online peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, is a, uh, you know, uh, a, a market, a credit market, uh, which uh, does not require, uh, you know, uh, you know, a long, this is a, a market in which uh, 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 sellers, in this case, uh, which are the, uh, you know, borrowers and uh, the lenders, uh, which are, you know, in this case, which are the buyers, you know, they purchase a loan, and they come together and then they exchange, uh, you know, the, the transactions on this, uh, platform. Uh, now, there's this two uh, le leading uh, companies in the United States, uh, Lending Club and Prosper. Uh, they are the uh, two major players. Uh, they, uh, they were actually uh, founded around the same time. 
And uh, 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 in general, most loans uh, are uh, for consumer loans or small business loans. They are typically three to five years uh, of duration and under $35,000. Uh, they're unsecured, which is you know, different from uh, uh, the traditional loans. Uh, so it's peer-to-peer -peer unsecured. In this case, uh, we believe that uh, there are two things that are important in considering the decision, uh, the, the allocation of decision rights. Uh, and the first is that uh, the loans, you know, being loans, they are relatively uh, homogeneous. Uh, so in other words, it's unlike uh, the uh, vacation rentals, uh, you know, on Airbnb, you know, which are quite, which could be quite different, you know, from one to the other location, you know, amenities and, you know, uh, aesthetic appeal and, and things like that. So loans are loans, so they are pretty homogenous. And the second thing we believe is that the, uh, in this case, the platform owner, uh, which is the you know, lending club or Prosper, uh, they actually have superior information about uh, the uh, borrower's uh, situations, the demography, you know, their private information, uh, you know, things about that, uh, things like that. But the uh, platform owner, they are not in a position to uh, disclose uh, to uh, transfer, you know, that sort of private information uh, to the, uh, uh, to, you know, to the, uh, to the, to the, to the, to the lenders, for example, they can only disclose so much on the website. Uh, so in this case, you know, what we did is that we compared two uh, different uh, pricing right regime. Uh, one was a lending club, uh, which uh, seems it's funding, you know, it uh, has always retained it, the, the, you know, the right to set a price in this case, which is the interest, interest, low interest rate, uh, they've also retained the right uh, to themselves. Uh, but uh, Prosper, uh, which uh, since its funding has been uh, using an auction-based you know, pricing model in which the lenders, you know, basically could view that as lenders pulling together and then collectively dec deciding on uh, the loan interest rate. Uh, so in this case for Prosper, uh, the decision right was with the complementors or lenders. Now, in uh, 2010, uh, December 2010, uh, Prosper decided to uh, uh, change uh, its uh, policy. And it, they wanted to uh, take the, the pricing right back uh, to the platform, uh, to the platform owner. And that creates a sort of a, a, a you know, natural experiment for us to exploit, uh, to examine you know, whether the change in the pricing right uh, you know, from uh, the complement to us you know, uh, to, uh, taken back to the uh, to a platform owner, how that would affect the market transactions. So that's one study. Uh, let's see, you know, how much time I have. I have uh, maybe another uh, two minutes. Um, so, uh, yeah. okay, so I want to talk about this access control a little bit uh, very quickly too. Uh, so access control has been uh, studied quite a bit and emphasized quite a bit, I think in the platform uh, literature. Uh, and here we define uh, access control as the formal and informal uh, governance mechanisms deployed by platform owners to determine who can join the platform and use the uh, digital interface and boundary resources. Now, of course, the, 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 the ability the platform has to uh, you know, uh, limit access or to grant access uh, is determined by the, the power that they have. And the, this power uh, is dependent on their ownership of the critical assets, which is the technology, the inf interface, the, in, in the architecture. Now, what's funny about, what's interesting about uh, pl uh, platform access control is that not deciding on the degree to which uh, platform owners should grant you know, wider access or narrow access to complement was, uh, is like balancing on the head of a pin. So the research shows that you know, wider access you know, can create, uh, uh, facilitate you know, the creation of network effects, for example, and then you know, can create, a, increase the attractiveness of the platform. But two, you know, wide access, you know, unlimited access uh, can also uh, destroy a, a platform and make uh, a lot of complement to us less off. Uh, so we have a paper uh, just came out in SMJ earlier this year. We look at uh, how the uh, platform's strong gatekeeping policy, in this case, the, that's the iOS, when that strong gatekeeping is breached, uh, in other words, the access control becomes deficient uh, because of jailbreak. Uh, how would uh, complement was in this case the app developers uh, not sharing on uh, you know communities like Stack Overflow or Reddit would change in terms of quantity or quality? Uh, so uh, we similarly use a, a research design uh, that allows us to adopt a, a difference in differences to technique. And in this case, we compare uh, iOS app developers and Android developers 
uh, before and after uh, the jailbreak uh, of iOS uh, 7. Now, let me uh, just conclude uh, very quickly. Uh, so uh, I believe that uh, looking at uh, platform governance uh, has uh, big implications for uh, cooperative strategy and cooperative strategy research. Uh, and more specifically, we take a very narrow view of platform governance in the sense that we zoom in on the governance role or orchestration role of platform owner. We can open up new interesting questions about cooperative strategy and co corporate strategy. So for example, how the governance design choices uh, made by a platform owner can affect the interactions between uh, platform owner, complementors, and users or customers. And this interaction could be, you know, interactions um, in the community, it could be interactions in terms of you know, economic transactions between them. And then how the environment, uh, the external environment uh, affects platform owners, governance and design choices over time across different contexts. And finally, governance and orchestration of such relationships and uh, interactions also affects uh, platform owners, uh, scope of decisions, uh, complement performance, innovation, creativity, and also uh, consumer welfare and other things that uh, uh, I believe Fen's going to talk about a little bit uh, later. Uh, I think that's all I have uh, for the uh, presentation. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Uh, that was very interesting and it's great to hear about your work. Um, so we have a question from John Maudsley. And John, if, I, uh, if there's anything uh, you want to add, please do so. So John is asking in terms of decision rights, does the power of the complement matter? For example, in the case of game consoles, can Sony easily dictate terms to a hit games developer? Right. Well, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, certainly, I think that power dynamics between uh, complementors and uh, platform owners, I think that matter a lot. Uh, I think in some of the examples I gave, uh, the complementors uh, might be, you know, uh, you know, for example, you know, many, much smaller firms. So for example, in the P2P uh, lending uh, context, right, those, uh, uh, those borrowers, lenders, they are typically smaller, uh, especially in the past. Now there's a change in, I think in law, uh, I forgot the specific year, I think 2012 or something, when uh, those P2P lending lenders, they started to allow uh, institutional lenders to actually uh, to use the service and that change, I think it potentially changed the, uh, you know, the power dynamics between the two, then, uh, you know, absolutely. So, I th so back to the question, I think the power uh, of the complement was, uh, I think they do matter. Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, so Natalie Burford has another question. Um, she wants you to elaborate on the determinants of platform boundaries relative to complementers and how these fit into the literature. For instance, travel platforms may include payment or messaging between customers, while other platforms may leave these functions or offerings to the complementers. Okay, so is the question about the boundary between the platform owner and the complementors? A determinants of platform boundaries relative to complementors and how these fit into the literature. Right. Does that help? Yeah, so. It's a great question. Um, I think uh, this um, it's a you know a complex question, and this has to do with you know uh, how do we what do we mean by the boundary of the firm? You know, is the boundary of the firm determined by products, by business, or by technologies, or by influence? Right. Um, and uh, I see that Nick is, uh, is smiling a little bit here. Uh, Nick is an expert in, in the boundary of the firm, um, and uh, you know uh, you know. Uh, Platform owner, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, in in in, in uh, a lot of situations, they have a lot of power. They have a lot of influence. And if the influence is, you know, if the if the boundary is determined by the influence, then you know, they 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 could explain. Um, and uh, uh, and also, I think this it seems to me that this has to do also with uh, the uh, the uh, the topic that uh, Finn's going to talk a little bit about uh, about the complement to uh, the, sorry, the platform owner's entry into uh, complement to a space. But I think the, the question also is that, you know, not in addition to, to entry into com, complement to a uh, space, can the platform owner provide, you know, resources, right? Provide, uh, you know, uh, uh, features or, act, you know, activities that can facilitate the uh, functioning of, a, you know, of the 
marketplace or the ecosystem. Um, so I, I don't feel I have a great answer, um, but um, uh, definitely I think the boundary uh, becomes a little bit, uh, you know, uh, blurred, I think in the uh, platforms as the case. Thank you, Tony. Uh, so we have a couple more minutes here uh, with Tony. So I wanted to ask a question. Um, so your work um, certainly speaks to the heter heterogeneous approaches that uh, platform mm -hmm. owners um, adopt uh, when governing their uh, ecosystem. So can you talk a little bit about some of the um, future research opportunities um, for us to develop a better understanding of how governance may vary across platforms, across context, and even across time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the, the question. Um, great question. Um, so, you know, I think when we were thinking about doing that review, review piece, we realized, you know, there's a huge amount of platform research, uh, you know, emerging in recent years and then uh, not just in management strategy, but also in other fields, uh, especially for example, MIS and also marketing. Um, so we started to take this, you know, governance sort of, you know, perspective and then try to synthesize them into, you know, different buckets uh, because we think, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the similarly disparate, uh, you know, uh, mechanisms or features uh, could be, uh, could be, could be viewed through a, a certain lens. And using that certain lens, you know, in this case, you know, we talk about incentive and control that can help us to, to, to better understand, you know, different strands, uh, you know, different means, you know, a, a, a platform owner can uh, orchestrate the activities of the uh, complement or so govern the relationships and make sure that value creation is being, you know, happening. And then uh, the platform owner can uh, also capture some of the value. So, um, so in other words, uh, so, so back to your question that, you know, governance mechanisms and design features are heterogeneous, but I think we could uh, develop a sort of a framework to uh, synthesize them uh, and then organize them into, you know, uh, you know, a certain, uh, let's say certain buckets and to help us to understand more formally. Uh, now, there, I think there are a lot of other interesting questions that people can study, you know, in uh, this context, which I talked about, we focused on the relation between platform owner and the complement was, but there are other things that we can talk about, you can study, you know, you can study, you know, the relationship between, uh, let's say the uh, platform owner and the user side, right, or the, uh, or even the interactions, you know, between uh, the complement was so interaction between the users, uh, or the relationship between the complement and the users. Uh, I think those are some of the things that we haven't delved much into, and we haven't found a whole, a, a lot of literature uh, on, on, the, on those dimensions. Um, that's why we did not review as much in our uh, review article. All right, and even with inside interactions, right? I think exactly. there's a lot less work on that as well. Okay, exactly with inside, right? Between complement or well, between right. users, right? For example, yeah. exactly. Thank you, Tony. Um, I think it's time for us to move to Feng Zhu. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony, and uh, thanks a lot, Christina. Let me share my screen. Uh, while we wait for uh, Feng, uh, there's another question in the chat from uh, Denisa. Yes, let's um, tackle that one, Tony, if you don't mind. Um, Denisa is asking, would you say that the importance of co governance, interactions, access is even more important given that we are seeing now in terms of attempts to regulate Facebook, Twitter, et cetera? Can we as strategy scholars contribute to the debate? Great question, yeah. Uh, thanks for asking. I think that's a great question which I didn't address. Uh, so the platform governance in my, in my world is a very narrow view of you know, what we mean by platform governance, you know, to regulators, to, to law scholars, I think they, they could, you know, mean different things. Uh, but I, I, uh, I agree with you that uh, uh, I think strategy scholars, management scholars could uh, make a contribution uh, to that area. And in fact, you know, uh, Fen's gonna talk about that. I think uh, platform owners entry into a uh, complement to a space and that's exactly what a management scholar is contributing to. Thank you, let me try again, yeah. Uh, Hopefully this time it's working, yeah. Can you see the slides now? Yeah. Yes, we can see the slides. Yeah, and uh, so uh, 
uh, I mean, continuing this conversation, right? I mean, uh, uh, today uh, we see so many platforms and also on top of these platforms, uh, we also uh, see so many kind of uh, uh, complementers, right? So for instance, on Facebook, on Uber, on Android, Amazon, all these platforms, we see essentially millions of complementers, right? Uh, uh, who are providing complementary products and services. And you could easily see this a mutually beneficial relationship between platform owners and also these complementers. For platform owners, these complementers are providing like a complementary services and creating additional value and also generating tons of indirect network effects in the sense that the more complementers you have, more users are going to be interested in your platform, more users also attract more complementers. And for complementers, these platforms essentially provide a very easy access right, to customers. So these, these platforms can cut down right, their customer acquisition costs significantly. But at the same time, right, we hear lots of stories that the relationship may not go very smoothly. So for instance, right, I mean, we probably have all heard about this recent battle between Epic and Apple, right? So this actually goes back to John's earlier question about like the relationship with these hit game developers, right? So Epic Games develops very popular games and Epic Games was not actually very happy about the 30% cut Apple is taking right, in, in its ecosystem. And Epic Games also wanted Apple to provide alternative uh, 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 payment methods, right? So allowing essentially third parties to bypass Apple system and to uh, conduct transactions. And uh, of course, right, Apple was not that willing to uh, do that. So this uh, is uh, one source of conflict here. And uh, we've all heard that during the pandemic, right, restaurants right, uh, will also complain about these food delivery platforms. On one hand, these food delivery platforms uh, uh, really kept these restaurants alive during the pandemic. But on the other hand, right, I mean, uh, these uh, delivery platforms were charging like a, a, a really high commission rates. So the restaurants were not happy with the commission rates to the extent that the cities, right, have to, uh, had to intervene and impose caps on the delivery fees. And these delivery platforms are also not so happy about some of the regulations uh, by the government. For instance, in this case, right, uh, DoorDash is complaining that uh, I mean, uh, New York City is wanted all the delivery platforms to share customer data with restaurants. So again, this is a question, right, about the, who owns the customers, right? Who should own this data, right? If the customer plays an order on DoorDash for uh, food from a particular restaurant, should the restaurant get the customer information or should DoorDash uh, 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 keep that information uh, exclusively? So this again, right, is related to what Tony mentioned about like all this access control, right? All these data sharing issues. And uh, uh, very recently, like uh, Apple, right, after uh, iOS uh, 14.5 introduced this interesting feature, allowing user to decide whether they should, would allow uh, a particular app to check their activities or not, right? And, uh, and uh, uh, on, on the one hand, like many users might be extremely happy with such features because uh, uh, like uh, it seems to be the case that the platforms are trying to protect their privacy. But they, on the other hand, like uh, uh, these uh, businesses will be affected if um, the majority of users choose not to share any kind of data with these apps. And, uh, and as a result, right, many of the businesses may not be able to rely on, for instance, ad-sponsored business model to offer free products to the, uh, the uh, uh, iPhone users. And uh, my doctor student, uh, uh, Tommy Fan Fang, did uh, uh, some research and to show that the, indeed, right, so uh, this uh, uh, kind of a sudden policy shift, right, by introducing this feature affected the uh, It seems we have another interruption. Feng, can you hear us? Feng, you seem, you seem to have frozen. Um, uh, <clears throat> while this is happening, I just want to invite everybody to... Uh, up. Up, there we go. Yeah, there are always like issues that platforms need to consider in kind of implementing new policy, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, sometimes you just have to consider multiple kind of uh, stakeholders, right, in order to decide what is really the optimal policy for you to uh, introduce. 
Yeah, uh, think about like uh, self-driving vehicle technologies, right? Google, of course, will have incentives to license these technologies to other car manufacturers. So, uh, and uh, as a way to position this uh, self-driving car technologies, uh, like uh, almost as Android for the for the uh, auto world, right? And uh, and uh, uh, Tesla, right? Elon Musk, uh, 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 three months ago, also kind of uh, 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 tweeted and mentioned that the Tesla was also inter interested in kind of opening up its uh, full self-driving technology, right? And the, to other car manufacturers. And so other car manufacturers can also use it. Now, this kind of makes it also more complicated in the sense that this kind of a technologies would, can become platforms. But at the same time, right, these car manufacturers uh, cho uh, that choose to develop, uh, develop their cars on Tesla's technology will inevitably have to compete against Tesla in the kind of the, uh, the car market as well, right? So, and the, uh, 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 so this, so there are lots of like a competitive and also collaborative that dynamics going on, right, uh, in a platform market space. Now, so uh, there are just a lot of platform governance uh, kind of decisions we could look at, we could study. So for for the rest of the talk, I'd like to just focusing on one kind of a. Uh, uh, area, right? And I'd like to kind of elaborate on it a little bit to show you like what kinds of research people have done, what are the findings like, uh, we have generated through the body of research. And this is about, uh, I mean, uh, the situation where platform owners right, may start to imitate third parties. And then uh, uh, platform owners may introduce similar products right, to uh, compete directly against these, their third party uh, providers. So we've all heard the story about like how Microsoft right competed with Netscape with its own kind of internet browser uh, in the 90s. But the story certainly didn't stop there, right? With every platform today, we see like uh, some similar dynamics, right? For instance, like on iOS today, right? I mean, and uh, like for instance, this Flashlight application used to be like one of the most popular applications in iOS store, but after iPhone embraced the flashlight application, uh, the feature as default feature right, uh, in iOS, then, I mean, uh, uh, not many people would be interested in downloading another flashlight application, right? And the Twitter acquired this kind of a uh, live video kind of a uh, 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 streaming uh, company called Periscope. And after the acquisi acquisition, Twitter instantly cut the access uh, of Meerkat, uh, which was actually the direct competitor of Periscope. Uh, 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 and the uh, Twitter, uh, uh, the, the company Twitter acquired. So there are lots of kind of uh, interesting issues, right? I mean, uh, around this uh, imitation and also competition. And uh, we all know, right? I mean, from reading the news and from reading some academic articles that, uh, I mean, uh, like uh, Amazon, right? Uh, like uh, could potentially be using right some of the uh, data from its own sellers right and uh, to launch competing products to compete against these third party sellers. Now, if you look at the literature, right, I mean, uh, there are a couple of com kind of a, almost competing perspectives in explaining such dynamics, right? So, uh, one perspective would say that if you are profit maximizing, right, so of course you have some like a strong incentives to kind of squeeze successful complementers because after all, right, you are creating value together, but on the other hand, you need to divide that value. And uh, so this is also consistent with uh, this uh, dilemma called the swimming sh with sharks dilemma. So, uh, which is based on resource dependence theory. So the idea is that the, when small companies try to kind of a, a partner with uh, a large companies, right? And try to capture some value and uh, and uh, you are really dealing with uh, sharks, right? And uh, then then there is a, a, a problem, uh, there, there is a challenge of how you can be able to capture lots of value in the end from this relationship. And there is also a long literature about this uh, competition, right? Where companies are cooperating in creating value, but also compete to capture value, right? So all these uh, per, uh, uh, perspectives or, or the, the, the different the streams of thoughts would kind of uh, suggest that uh, indeed the platform owners would have incentives to uh, kind of enter and compete. But on the other hand, right? I mean, uh, like uh, if you truly believe like uh, ecosystems, and uh, I mean, uh, you hear also uh, different stories uh, saying that the platform owners should care about the overall health of the ecosystem, right? I mean, by competing 
directly with complementers, you're sending negative signals, whether discourage them from entering or innovating on your platform, right? And maybe pushing them to your competitors' platforms, right? And uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, some scholars uh, went went further to argue that uh, I mean, like, yeah, it's really about uh, kind of a, a value co-creation, and uh, uh, the platforms are, are thriving together with these uh, third parties, right? So so if your own survival depends on how your complementers are doing, then you should proactively maintain the health of entire ecosystem. Now, it turns out that uh, there, there is actually a, a body of uh, uh, empirical research right, in this space, trying to understand, for instance, why platforms would choose to enter or why platforms choose not to enter. And some of them would also look at like, okay, if platforms choose to compete directly with third parties, what would be the impact, right? So, uh, I mean, uh, I'm showing you just a subset of these papers, but the list actually uh, is uh, much, much longer than uh, uh, the ones I have here. So just to, to kind of uh, uh, give some kind of a, a quick summary of this body of literature, right? So uh, 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 lots of papers have looked at this issue about the motivation. Why were platforms doing that, right? And uh, some of the earlier work by Gower and Kuzumano and, uh, and uh, uh, Rebecca Anderson basically show that some platforms would actually try, their, try very hard to avoid the entry, right? They started in the setting of Intel. They found that the Intel, right, even used organizational structure or processes to make sure that uh, in, uh, like uh, uh, Intel doesn't send this negative signal. And uh, Intel wanted to convince all these complementers that uh, uh, Intel wants them to be successful as well. Intel wants them to make money, right? And, uh, uh, and uh, there are also other studies uh, who uh, have shown that uh, if you look at the platform owner's entry pattern, they tend to target uh, these uh, very kind of uh, successful areas, right? The areas where like uh, you could potentially generate lots of profits. And that's where platforms would enter. And this seems to be quite consistent with uh, uh, platforms profit maximizing objectives. And uh, there are also uh, some studies based on like sometimes even case studies suggesting that, uh, I mean, uh, the, the motivation for platform owner entry can go well beyond uh, just the va uh, value capture, right? So for instance, like uh, Google, for instance, right? Sometimes would kind of uh, uh, embrace some of the innovation by like uh, uh, Android app developers and introduce their own Android apps, right? But uh, some studies have shown that, uh, I mean, uh, by entering directly, Google could reduce the redundant development efforts, right? And also kind of a direct innovation efforts of these third parties into kind of a territories that uh, hasn't been uh, kind of uh, attracting lots of attention from these third parties. So there seems to be some social welfare or social efficiency gain by platforms direct entry. And when I interviewed JD about uh, why JD wanted to offer some pro uh, like a product directly by itself, and the JD would uh, even restrict right uh, uh, some of the uh, pro uh, like uh, categories to itself exclusively, saying that okay for these categories I don't want any third party sellers. Part of the motivation is because uh, JD as an e-commerce platform wanted to kind of uh, minimize essentially counterfeits, right? So for instance, like for some product categories, like very expensive premium bags, right? JD just wanted to be the exclusive seller. Uh, JD doesn't want any third party sellers. And sometimes the uh, platforms wanted to enter simply because they want to kind of make sure that some innovations can be widely available to all developers uh, uh, if uh, when this innovation is offered directly by uh, the platforms itself, right? For instance, like by incorporating this uh, flashlight uh, uh, feature uh, as a default feature, then all third-party developers could leverage that feature instantly. You don't have to like a kind of a, a worry that consumers may not have the flashlight functionality enabled or installed in their phone, right? It's already there. And you can develop like additional kind of uh, applications based on this particular feature. And there are also lots of research looking at the impact of platform entries. And in general, right, it seems to be the case that across all studies, the effect on platform users, at least in the short term, can, is usually positive. For instance, like if Amazon decided to offer some products by Amazon itself, and the users will be perfectly happy to just buy right, the, their product because their product is offered by Amazon, and presumably, like, uh, I mean, uh, users would trust Amazon slightly more than some of the third-party sellers on Amazon. 
And it turns out that, uh, I mean, uh, the, the literature uh, uh, identifies some mixed effect on the complementers through platform uh, owner entry, right? So some studies uh, documented some positive spillover effect from one app to others, right? In the sense that, okay, after, for instance, Facebook decided to kind of uh, acquire Instagram, right? Vertically integrated with this photo kind of sharing application. It turns out that the demand for other photo sharing application also increased. Why? Because, I mean, uh, consumers are paying more attention to this product category. So uh, as a result, they started to experiment with other third party apps as well. And so there could be some positive spillover effect. Right. And uh, and uh, there could also be uh, like uh, some positive spillover effects through indirect network effects in the sense that uh, as platforms started to offer some blockbuster third party uh, uh, like a first party apps themselves, right? For instance, Microsoft, right, introducing new video games by itself. Sony introduced new video games by itself. These video games can be blockbuster video games that increase the installed base of video game consoles. More people are buying these video game consoles. And this is actually good for third parties, right? I mean, even though, I mean, uh, these video games might be competing with them, but at least it enlarges the number of uh, uh, video game players associated with that particular council. Right? But some other studies have found that it could be negative right, uh, uh, through like direct competition. Right? It could really reduce the demand for some of third party apps. Right? What's missing in our understanding across all these studies is like a, really the long-term effect, right? So uh, is this really discouraging like a future kind of potential third parties entering into the market, right? Is this going to kind of, a, uh, kind of a, uh, harm the consumers because the platforms are becoming less innovative because they third parties are no longer introducing new innovations after seeing that uh, they might be squeezed or, or, or harmed by the platform's direct entry. Right? And this is, uh, I've also given this uh, a little bit more uh, uh, thoughts recently, right? In the sense that in the case of Intel, it seems to make lots of sense for Intel try to not to send a negative signal to third parties because to innovate on Intel's microprocessor technology, it requires huge amount of upfront right, investment, lots of fixed cost, right? So to encourage third parties to incur that fixed cost, you really want to make sure that uh, the third parties uh, are confident that they could make some money later on. But it, this argument may not uh, carry through on the Amazon setting in the sense that the launching business on Amazon uh, is so like uh, 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 easy today, right? I mean, in the sense that you could leverage Amazon's fulfillment services and you don't even need a warehouse. Right? And because the entry barrier is so low, right? As long as you can make some money, even for a short window right, uh, of time, you may still choose to enter, right? So even though you're anticipating that uh, maybe if your product becomes extremely successful, one day you may have a lot of competition from other third party sellers or maybe sometimes from Amazon and you may still enter. So as a result, right? I mean, Amazon's action may not be that harmful uh, uh, from the innovation perspective. But uh, I mean, uh, I mean, this is just some hypothesis, right? I mean, uh, I haven't seen any studies documenting any long-term effect, right? And uh, some studies also look at like what kind of responses, right? Complementers can use to protect themselves better, right? So some studies show that uh, complementers could leverage uh, IP rights, patents, copyrights. So complementers could uh, reallocate their resources, right? Into different territories, right? Or into territories that the platforms are less likely to uh, enter, essentially these uh, more niche categories, right? And the complementers could also strategically time their uh, release, the uh, product release so that they don't run into direct competition with the platform owner's own products. And uh, sometimes complementers can also limit the demand signal to the platforms to survive in the sense that, okay, if the platform is using the demand as a threshold to say, oh, this product is really taking off, we should consider offering ourselves. Then if uh, by charging a high price, you're gonna reduce the demand and the platform may not pay attention to your products as a result. Right. Complementers can also disintermediate, right? This happens in the hotel industry a lot in the sense that the uh, Marriott, all these uh, hotels, like uh, they want to, you to sign up for their own memberships. They want you to uh, you to not book through this uh, online travel agency, OTAs. They want you to go directly to their own channels, right? And the restaurants would try their best to tell you that, you know what? Like, 
try to order directly from restaurants, not through these uh, intermediaries, because uh, you you help us survive and help us like save the commission rates. Right, and in some cases, uh, like uh, even collective negotiation took place in some industries. For instance, the newspapers, right, and in the U.S., are, uh, especially these local newspapers, are collectively in uh, wa uh, wanted to kind of uh, negotiate with Facebook and Google uh, on the uh, on the commissions because they provide the value to Facebook and Google, right? And uh, but they had to ask for permission from the government to do that because a collective negotiation is almost like a price fixing, right? So they, they could, uh, in usual scenarios, this could uh, kind of be considered as anti-competitive, but given how terrible newspaper industry is doing in general, I mean, in, in many cases, the government may allow them to negotiate uh, collectively with the big platforms. Yeah. And there are also lots of interesting questions like uh, uh, future scholars could consider, right? I mean, uh, will complementers become more com innovative as a result of competition, right? Because after all, right, I mean, uh, competition may kind of uh, uh, may be good, right, in the sense that it will encourage complementers to innovate. And how can complementers leverage other channels, for instance, uh, they are direct to consumers channels, right? Nike, for instance, right, in 2019 decided not to sell um, Amazon directly, and uh, instead it decided to grow its own kind of a channel, right? And so this could be one example, right? Complementers could, could also effectively leverage their own channels. And, uh, and also, uh, how uh, does the entry mode of the platform moderates the response, right? Sometimes the platform could enter through acquisition. Sometimes the platform could enter through like really uh, building products themselves, uh, uh, whether a different entry mode could affect the uh, complementer's uh, response uh, differently or not is an interesting question. So just to quickly summarize, like lots of interesting empirical evidence, right? And the, most of them are based on studies of individual industries uh, or individual platforms. And in many aspects, right, the evidence can be mixed, right? And so that, that's actually interesting in the sense that uh, and for any uh, uh, platform market, right? So we actually need some empirical studies to help us understand like the, 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 the competitive or cooperative dynamics in that market and to inform platforms governance uh, strategy and also inform policymakers' decisions. And I would say that, the, I mean, uh, uh, going beyond this direct entry interaction between platform owners and complementers are, are, are super rich in practice, as Tony also uh, uh, mentioned, right? And, uh, and provide many uh, new opportunities for academic research. And I would also add that uh, given like a, Different countries today, right, are, are trying to regulate uh, the, the platform markets, and uh, the, uh, we are observing lots of policy changes. And uh, and so uh, that's great for empirical researcher because you could leverage these policy ch uh, changes uh, to uh, examine right the impact of uh, basically different platform actions uh, on basically different sides of the market. Right, you do need like a, some kind of a, uh, external shocks, right, to to infer some causal relationships. Okay, so I would end here and uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Feng. Um, I think we have, uh, we can save a couple of minutes and ask a question. Um, this is a question that I have and it seems Joe Pluk has a related one, which is um, on the conditions that may influence the long-term effect of platform sponsor um, entry on the health of the ecosystem or on growth or other sort of strategic um, outcomes of interest. So Joe Plu is asking, should we be making a distinction, distinction between digital and non-digital platforms when considering this long-term effect? Um, he assumes that generational breaks, for instance, between non-digital platforms change how such long-term effects play out. So just interesting to hear kind of like your thoughts on the conditions that may influence kind of the long-term impact. Right. So I, I uh, like uh, uh, I would say that uh, I mean uh, Joe, you are really ahead of uh, most of the scholars in the sense that the right now I'm actually not seeing like uh, any academic research just on looking at the long term effect at this moment, right? Uh, not the, like so. So your your point is like saying that okay, if we want to study long term effect, there could be some uh, moderating roles or there could be some distinction between just the purely digital platforms and maybe non digital platforms. But I would say that uh, I mean uh, I mean even before we go there, right? 
just like if anyone wanted to kind of study long term effect just for any platforms, uh, that's already a welcome addition to uh, to to the kind of a platform literature. And uh, so yeah, so so uh, I mean I, I I think like uh, there could there are definitely issues you need to consider right from uh, digital non digital aspects. But I would uh, first encourage us just to 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 to, to first study some platforms first. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, there, there seems to be, Tony is answering one of the questions online. So um, if everyone is on board, we can stop here or we can take, we can do one more question. What do you think? Let's do one more question. I think we have a little bit of time. Okay, fantastic. So Feng, so as we see platforms proliferate, as we see new technologies advance, do you think that there are certain changes in both platform competition and governance as we know it today that are unavoidable? Um, and do you think that any of these advancements will and should impact how we think about platforms, platform competition, and even platform governance? Totally, right? So uh, uh, in parallel to all the platform strategies, right? Technologies are also evolving and uh, we see new technologies such as blockchain. And uh, many people actually think that uh, with blockchain technology, like uh, uh, ultimately uh, like in the future, we may not uh, have like a very influential aggregators, right? The economy should be decentralized, right? Instead of centralized, right? But uh, uh, this is also interesting space, right? For us to uh, conduct research to see whether this is such a searching is true or, or what are the missing ingredients? Because I mean, platforms are serving kind of, a, for instance, uh, lots of important loads, right? In addition to just the payments, like uh, the platforms also conducting matching in the sense that it makes it a lot easier for me to find the, the product I like, right? It also is facilitating the transactions in the sense that, oh, if the third party is not delivering the product, right? So who should I be complaining to, right? The platform can step in and resolve all these disputes, right? So, I mean, uh, so, uh, like uh, would the blockchain technologies completely replace these roles, right? So, or what other technologies, right? Uh, should we be uh, uh, looking into, right? To to kind of a. Uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, meet these uh, particular needs, right? So certainly, right, when all these other ingredients are ready, it's possible that we're actually moving from this uh, centralized world, right, economy to more decentralized uh, world. In, in that case, like uh, uh, the, the power of the platforms can be significantly reduced, but uh, certainly we are not there yet, right? Even if you look at some of the kind of a, a, a new space like NFT, right? I mean, uh, we, we still see the emergence of lots of platforms in that space, right? Yeah, and I think for anyone interested in platforms or considering entering the platform research space, I think these are exciting news because we certainly see um, a lot more research in, in this space that builds on your work and Tony's work. Um, so I look forward to seeing how the field evolves. So thank you. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thank everyone. you very much. Uh, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Fang. Thank you, Christina, for leading this great dialogue. It was wonderful. Um, I look forward to our next installment of the SMS Dialogues, which we'll uh, announce soon. And uh, if you want to share, uh, know more about uh, blockchain governance that Feng just mentioned, please so join our webinar tomorrow, which will be on blockchain governance. Um, and other than that, I wish you all a happy afternoon, a happy night, and uh, see you hopefully soon. <laughs>